Hello, uh, thank you for coming to this talk about uh, the Linux sensor. Uh, my name is Dara O'Reilly. And uh, Michael. Yeah, and I'm Michael Pauk. Oh. Um, today we go through uh, why do we need the Linux sensor and uh, what needs to be monitored, uh, how has it been done, and um, just some more information about the rollout, and then we'll have a QA. and a I think you skip. Yeah. So, so uh, before we st start with like the meat, meat of the talk, I think it's uh, understand. Uh, it's important to understand like why we are actually uh, doing uh, the server monitoring. Why do we want to achieve this? Uh, the pro and statement can be very succinctly put in that yes, there is a need uh, to have a uh, visibility into the uh, Linux environment, uh, it's USA. And uh, for, like, it not only helps us as cybersecurity team internally uh, during the incident investigations and like assessing the overall impact of incidents, but there are also multiple uh, external uh, requirements uh, that uh, require us to have some kind of uh, monitoring and uh, logging in place. Uh, first of all, like the, the, the business itself has uh, committed to uh, address any uh, remaining gaps that we have. Uh, there are various certifications that have uh, set up uh, and require several like, technical controls about monitoring. Uh, insurance providers will be far happier when you tell them that you did everything you can to address uh, any risks once you uh, choose to uh, make an insurance claim. And uh, last but not least, uh, the customers who are, uh, they are doing their supplier assessments and uh, you know doing the due diligence, uh, which company to pick. Uh, they uh, will send us a lot of questions, huge questionnaires uh, with a lot of good questions and uh, those good questions deserve uh, good answers. So, with the, the problem established, there are a lot of like commercial solutions that you can get. You know, it's you, you buy it from the vendor, uh, you deploy it, it uh, works. Like the the first one mentioned, the CrowdStrike Falcon. Uh, that's what we are using to monitor like the uh, endpoint devices, uh, Windows Macs, but it's not not really uh, usable for for Linux environment. Uh, first of all, like all of these solutions, proprietary solutions, are are closed source. I would be very hard pressed to, to find uh, anything that would be open source. Uh, they are doing nasty things to the kernel. Usually they are just shipping some binary blobs uh, that you can really inspect. They have a lot of uh, anti-temper measures, so uh, reversing them is not really an option. Uh, and most of them uh, are communicated with cloud. In fact, all of them, even those that have some kind of on-premise offering, uh, in reality, it's just about data residency. They are communicating with the cloud to uh, perform their operations. So the decision was made, like, okay, if we cannot find anything, uh, can we like make, make our own? And that's how uh, the Linux Security Sensor project was made. This is like the internal name. Uh, it is actually based on the, uh, apps, the, the um, open source project called Verosilaptor. And uh, well, there will tell you more about that. I will just mention very briefly the overall architecture, how it works, uh, just to give you some kind of idea. Uh, like with other uh, EDRs, you have a um, sensor that is deployed on the clients. Those are uh, reporting the events uh, to the central server. And in our case, it is being forwarded uh, to a log storage, which is like CM, like security uh, information event management system which is just fancy way of saying some kind of log storage with uh, alerting and uh, detections. Before I go over uh, the, detection, the data that are being collected and the uh, detections that we are doing over them, uh, I think it's good to have some kind of structure. And uh, I chose like this uh, cyber kill chain model, uh, which is just describing you the steps that the attacker has to take in order for them to succeed. The model has like its own problems, but it's good enough for a presentation to give it some structure so that you understand what kind of scenarios we are trying to prevent. So it can be uh, in context of this project, uh, the reconnaissance phase, like 
the attacker trying to figure out what is running where. Uh, that's not really uh, what we are trying to address with, with this project. Uh, there are other ways you can uh, you can address that with uh, like information denial and other things. Uh, making exploits for for uh, the environment uh, to to breach. Uh, that's also uh, out of sc scope of this project. We are really trying to just focus on those four in the middle. Uh, and well, uh, that's it. You basically want to have monitoring uh, to prevent uh, these steps. Should we succeed in one of these, the attack should be prevented, in theory. <laughs> so, uh, for the first stage delivery, that is, you know, the attacker is trying to actually uh, get to the machine itself, usually after uh, they have managed to, to exploit the vulnerability. Uh, we want to prevent it through uh, logging uh, success and failures. This is like very pretty much the, uh, the SSH access log uh, that is uh, logging successes, failures. Uh, if you don't have fail to ban set up, uh, like this the should uh, generate alerts. Like if you have a machine that had uh, 20 unsuccessful logging attempts and the uh, 21st succeeds, you know that something's up. Uh, Unlike the local solutions for like monitoring of accesses, uh, when you have it deployed to an entire fleet or like the sections of servers, you can detect things like uh, password spraying that is trying uh, like free attempts on a lot of machines. That's not something you can uh, see from just a single host. Next up, we want, uh, we want to see uh, which packages are being installed. Uh, this is less about the package itself, but more about the, where it comes from. Uh, SUSE has invested a lot of efforts to make sure that the uh, build process and like the delivery of, of packages is uh, secure. Uh, but when it comes to, uh, we would like to be able to demonstrate that uh, what is installed on the servers uh, actually comes from official SUSE repositories and it's not just uh, from other sources, basically. And uh, Last one is like the monitoring of specific locations. These are uh, like the temporary folders and uh, various other uh, like locations that are uh, often targeted by malware because of uh, they are easily accessible uh, and you can execute from those. Uh, the example is like, as I mentioned, you have a temporary partition that uh, does not have like no exact flex set, so malware just uh, copies itself there uh, through some web server as a file upload or something, and then uh, pivots from, from, from those locations. Uh, we would like to know about the uh, changes, like new files, uh, changes of attributes, and, and so on. Next, uh, what, what the solution uh, should be logging is uh, process creation. That's basically what the, all the EDRs are doing. Uh, in our case, it, it is logging the uh, command line, like the execution itself, but not the environment variables. So if you have some secrets, please put them into uh, environment variables or uh, contact us, you have the, the, the data removed. Uh, any form of uh, user level escalations and uh, well, job scheduling. That's basically just, yeah, we will execute the process sometime in the future. Uh, when it comes to persistence, that is, the attacker uh, will just uh, leave something on the system, a new user account or something, uh, to be revisited later. Uh, the, the sensor logs uh, all the uh, changes to the user accounts, uh, changes to groups, and yeah, I mean, there is some overlap uh, with the previous, previous uh, sections, with like task scheduling and uh, new packages. And uh, last but not least, uh, we w want to get like the information about the DNS requests uh, so that uh, they can be compared to the existing databases of uh, already existing malicious domains and uh, command control servers so that uh, you can watch for uh, signs of infection. And we also would want to know if actual uh, connection has been established to these uh, uh, other servers, <laughs> let's put it that way. Uh, all of this is in the project documentation. If you want to see details and like uh, exactly w w what the logs look like, what they are used for, uh, it can be all found on, on Confluence. 
So I've been talking about like the detections and uh, things we are, we are looking for, but it's called like endpoint detection and response. Uh, so it's only fair that I mentioned the response part of it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, the the client that is installed does have response capabilities, which effectively give a, a means to uh, execute uh, scripts uh, on the on the host. Uh, Usually during incident investigation, this is like one of the last options we go for. When we were doing incident investigation, we reach out to the uh, system owner first and uh, try to get them, uh, like get them to resolve the issue. But there are some cases in which that is not feasible or, or uh, difficult to do. Uh, in such cases, we do contact the owner uh, first uh, to, to, you know, uh, kind of uh, collaborate with them, but. Uh, if we if we don't know who the owner is, it, it can be very difficult. So in the netbox or rec tables, when there is a contact field, like please keep that updated, because a blank field doesn't really tell us much. Uh, to prevent misuse of this functionality, uh, these things are not accessible by default. You need to assign special permissions. When you do so, it will uh, send out lots of emails, lots of alerts, like hey, somebody is trying to access this functionality. Uh, do something about it. All of the uh, operations are logged, as you can see uh, at, at the bottom. We have like the time when it was happened, what the command was run, who, who ran it, what was the output, and so on. Uh, yeah. So I will now hand over to Daryl, who will talk about like how how the actual uh, client is built uh, and how it works. Yeah, so just a quick uh, overview of Velociraptor. Um, it's a digital forensic and incident response tool. It's open source. It's got no closed uh, kernel modules. It's easy to deploy. It's got its own uh, query language called VQL. And um, just to note, the Linux sensor is a fork um, within SUSE of the upstream project. And I'll go through the differences in a while. So a bit more on the Velociraptor client. Um, obviously, you install this on the endpoints that need to be monitored. Um, again, it's easy to deploy. Um, just just in a, a package. It doesn't. The package itself doesn't have any dependencies on other packages. It contains a binary which is just about 60 megabytes, uh, with no with no dependencies. Maybe glibc. And uh, it's available as a system D service, and you, you just start the service and kick it off, and, and then uh, nothing else needs to be done. And recently, this is just scripted, so the script will determine uh, the, the uh, distribution, your distribution, and what binary you need. And when it's running normally, it keeps a persistent persistent connection with the server. Um, but if, if, it, if it can't uh, have comms with the server, it'll continue to, uh, to gather event, events. It'll, and when the connection comes back, it'll upload them again. So a bit on the Velociraptor server. Um, it's made up of the front end, which is the part that handles the connections from the client. Um, it has its own certificate authority, which, which is used for the encryption with the endpoints and for identification. Um, and the, the clients uh, are told what to collect uh, from the server. And then uh, the endpoints, the clients and the endpoints uh, start sending the events to the server. Uh, the events are just stored to disk. Um, there's no um, database or anything complicated like that. Um, it's just uh, every event is just another line of YAML written to a file. And then there's the GUI for the administration, uh, which is a web application. So, um, you know, it, it allows you to, to run queries on the endpoints. Uh, you could just run an ad hoc query on one endpoint or a collection of endpoints, which is called a hunt. Um, and it supports kind of standard um, security things you would expect, like uh, multi multi factor authentication and predefined uh, user roles. 
So uh, it also has an, an API which you can use to automate some things. Uh, I haven't used that yet. So uh, probably the most noticeable thing about Veloc uh, Velociraptor is that it has its own uh, query language called VQL. So the reason for this is it makes the tool flexible um, because you know, in the security world, there's new threats coming along all the time and you need to be able to respond quickly. Um, you know, you don't want to have to rebuild binaries and push out binaries to endpoints and restart them and all of that. With VQL, you can write a query and push it out and get results within minutes. Um, so it's like SQL, um, except in SQL you have tables, in VQ VQL you have plugins. Uh, as the source of the data. And um, so Velociraptor already comes with lots of plugins included. Like you got a Glob pl uh, uh, plugin if you want to um, find files on file system or a stat file, to, a stat plugin to get information about a file and so on. And there's also functions. There's functions to deal with strings. There's hash function, path functions. There are hundreds of these functions. So um, on the right-hand side is an example of some simple VQL. Um, this one uses the interfaces plugin, which returns a row for every network interface on your system. Um, the interfaces plugin brings a number of fields into the scope. Um, in this case, we're just looking at name and hardware address string, and we apply an upcase function to the hardware address string. And then, like in SQL, there's a where clause, and here we eliminate the um, loopback interface. So artifacts. So when you write VQL, usually you have to wrap them up in artifacts, which are just YAML files um, with some standard fields like name, description, precondition. We only want this one to run on Linux uh, systems. The type, it's a client event, which constrains it to run on the client. Um, event means it runs forever uh, generating rows. And then you can pass parameters to artifacts. Uh, this one is just one parameter. And at the very bottom, you've got the actual queries. And this one has just one query. And it's using the watch journal plugin, which returns a row for every time there's a new message to the journal D uh, log file. So, so writing VQ, VQL and artifacts is straightforward enough. It's high level language, but you need to have the right plugins to provide the data in the first place. And uh, this is one place where the upstream Velociraptor project was lacking when it came to Linux. Um, it had good support for Windows, but lacking support for, for uh, Linux. So uh, the team um, in SUSE, um, took some of the existing plugins and improved them. I believe their RPM plugin and the audit plugin, and maybe many more as well, and also created some new plugins, including uh, BPF plugins. Also, uh, Jeff done a LogScale plugin, which actually runs on the server side, and it forwards the events to LogScale. And this has actually been upstream back into the upstream Velociraptor project. Okay, some more about the audit plugin. Um, the audit plugin is the one we use uh, most frequently uh, to, to uh, satisfy the requirements from the cybersecurity team. So it uses the audit, uh, Linux audit framework underneath um, just a refresher if, you're, if you haven't used it recently. Um, you can use it to audit system calls. Um, there's this audit CTL uh, command line program. In the first example, we're audit the uh, chmod uh, system call. Um, the dash k means um, a key. So any events that are generated from this rule will be tagged with this key. And um, you can also use it to watch files and directories um, with the dash W. Um, the dash P, read, write, execute, and attribute changes. So 
the reads and the writes here aren't actually read and writes. They're, it's more like when the file is opened with read or write permission because um, every read and write would be very expensive overhead. So the upstream Velociraptor already has, has an audit plugin, but um, the team found problems with it when they tried it out. Uh, one thing is rules would be lost. Um, the, the, the plugin itself didn't manage the rules. Um, you had to insert them independently yourself. So in the artifact, you would shell out run the audit CTL um, uh, command line to insert the rules. Um, the problem with that is if um, if you know if the audit audit service was restarted, then the rules will be lost, and and that was a problem. Another thing is uh, events would could be dropped even on a lightly loaded system. Um, so each each plugin was running independently, and it was listening on a multicast socket from the kernel for these events, and. If you don't pick up the events quickly enough, the kernel will drop them. So uh, Jeff rewrote the plugin completely to to fix these problems, maybe other problems uh, as well. And um, so to, about the rules, the missing rules. Uh, now the plugin manages the rules. You pass them as a parameter, a list, and then it it'll monitor the rules, and if they go missing it'll reinsert them automatically. For the uh, dropped events, uh, now the architecture is completely changed. Um, there's a producer subscriber model, and now all the plugins are subscribers, and um, this, the, the producer side has a thread that uh, tries to grab as many events uh, using the non-block and read from the Netlink socket, and then it, it, it queues them and then another thread comes along and parses them, and then, and then there's a, a loop that distributes them to the subscribers. And then there's also some other improvements like uh, reusing buffers to uh, reduce garbage collection overhead. So at the end, it's, it's quite easy to use. At the bottom, you just call the auto plugin and you pass the rules as a parameter, and it brings a load of fields into the scope. And you can check the audit documentation for those. So the audit plugin could do a lot of things, but there are still some things um, missing, like the new TCP connections, the DNS requests, and some file attribute changes. So uh, the team researched this and they found uh, BPF to be a good uh, solution uh, to these requirements. So um, it was uh, Nick, for ourself um, developed uh, plugins. So I'm just gonna give a high level overview of how this works because I'm not an expert. Um, so we have this um, package libppfgo um, that allows us to write the programs using C. Um, we compile with clang, statically link with uh, libppf, the C library. Then we embed that object into the um, the uh, Velociraptor client. Then at runtime, um, libppf go is able to load that, those BPF modules into the kernel. So uh, one thing we depend on um, is core e, compile once, run everywhere. This allows our BPF programs to run across uh, different versions of the kernel. As long as the kernel supports uh, this BTF, um, and kernels from SLE 15 SB3 do, uh, uh, SB3 updates do. Um, if you want more details about that, uh, Nick did a presentation for this 2022 Susie Labs conference where he goes into a deep dive about that. So the actual plugins themselves. Um, so TCP Snoop, um, it, works by attaching K probes and kernel return probes on INET CSK except that's be for inbound uh, connections and TCP V4 or V6 connect for outbound connections. Um, DNS snoop, it works a bit differently. It works more like how um, TCP dump works and 
the BPF level is just does enough parsing of every packet to determine whether it's a UDP uh, uh, packet on port 53. And if it is, it sends it on to the Velociraptor, to the Golang side of things, user space, where it's uh, fully parsed and all the DNS fields we need are extracted. Then the last one is Chatter Snoop. Um, this one uh, checks for changes to the mutable file attributes. Um, so this works by, well, originally it was working by doing a K probe on do VSS IOCTEL, but we found uh, uh, there's some kernels that didn't have that symbol. Um, we think it's a small function and it just got inlined. So we moved it uh, down the code chain to the next one, which was security file IOCTEL. Uh, this symbol, this is exported, so it should be okay. And then it checks the arguments um, that it's uh, set flags and that's immutable has changed and it can go off and determine the file name. The pr yeah, the problem, we couldn't use an audit for this because the audit system call context doesn't include the path name and it's not easy to find the path name. So uh, project status, um, what we need to do is uh, more test automation because uh, we have a lot of different platforms and then we have also S390, PowerPC and ARM systems as well. And um, we should look into, can, can we improve performance? Um, and also packaging, um, we want to get it packaged on Fedora and Red Hat as well. Um, we have just got Debian and Ubuntu, well, some versions done. And uh, now we're just uh, starting the rollout and I'll pass it back. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just put a couple of words about the rollout, uh, things that, that, that you need to know. Uh, currently, the plans are only to deploy this uh, on the servers. Uh, there are absolutely no plans to push this uh, on, on workstations. Uh, the goal is to have uh, like 95% of uh, all the state uh, monitored by, uh, through this uh, center project. Mm, but you know, there are some uh, special cases uh, where, where that might not uh, be feasible. Uh, if you think that uh, your infrastructure that you're managing uh, falls under these special cases, please get in touch with us. Uh, we will look at it and then, yeah, we will determine uh, if, if uh, it is a special case or not. Uh, Currently, the only like the rule of thumb, if you to, to know if this should uh, have, uh, if this should be enrolled or not, uh, is to if if it is a server that is uh, has permanent access to like the internal network, then it most likely uh, should should be enrolled into this. Uh, DMZ hosts uh, are currently not not in the rollout. Uh, we do need uh, to have like duplicate infrastructure for DMZ. So uh, those are currently not, not, not in scope, but will be in the future. Uh, as Daryl mentioned, uh, deployment is, is fairly uh, straightforward. Uh, you, there is a single script uh, that will do most of the work for you. Uh, currently we have like 440 hosts this morning uh, already uh, running this. Uh, and yeah, for that, uh, all, all the thanks to all of the people who were testing it before. Uh, and all the people that were working on this project. And yeah, uh, thank you for uh, your attention during this talk. Uh, now I think it's like the Q&A time. <laughs> so if you have any questions. question actually if mm -hmm. the number one if uh, what are the plans for our department for IT uh, IT is also in scope it is not excluded so, <laughs> so we should talk you know after we, the we talk. will talk uh, okay. like the, the first deployment was uh, like the testing one was mm -hmm. in uh, SUSE labs and like the, the, the testers but so naturally the scope was then uh, 
extend it to all the BCL, but yeah, the goal is to include ECM and NIT as well. Okay, and the second is uh, from that what you already monitor, do you have any results or how you process the data later on, like to see the alerts and yeah, if there uh, is something, you know, which you saw? <laughs> As I mentioned, we have like the detection rules that are processing the alerts. Uh, some of them are still being uh, developed as we are waiting for uh, the uh, server part to be done. Uh, but I don't have any examples that I can just readily show you. I can, I can, we can think later, uh, mm -hmm. or maybe we'll do some kind of spotlight uh, on the how the detections on the back end work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so my question would be uh, two. Um, first one, um, so uh, currently the, the version that we uh, deployed had uh, yeah, originally came with a pretty uh, high log level, um, which is actually the most annoying thing because, I mean, I don't really care about the performance, it's not that bad, but the log level that is cutting up the system log, will that change in the future? Might be put. <laughs> yeah, um, we have fixed that already, so... Um, so now the verbose login is, is turned off by default in the okay. config file. Okay, that's good. Yeah. 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 The thing is, yeah, this config file and the way we are deploying it yeah, seems to come from, I'm not sure, the RPM, some server, it, anyway, it was... It, it comes from yeah. cyber security. Yeah, it was, it was written in a way that I cannot easily change it without it getting overwritten, which is why I was, at, le at least um, I remember it when I deployed it initially some time ago when the um so the other thing is uh, you mentioned that when it loses the connection to the server it will cache the stuff mm -hmm. so what will this mean for write cycles on the disk when i'm using disks that will easily break when there are too many write cycles so it's it's only for events so you know they're written to um to a file on disk, so I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of events. Um, like, you mean size-wise or uh, yeah, write cycle-wise. So, so the yeah. thing is, uh, for example, I've had one system where mm. the root file system is on an SD card, and uh, yeah, you know how long they last when I write too much. Mm. And so, what I did was I uh, yeah mounted the directory where Velociraptor will cache the stuff to to a temp fs, and uh, maybe uh, you could change it so that it if the events don't take much space then we can't could yeah put them to a temp fs anyway maybe so that we don't run into this issue without me having to think about anything when deploying velociraptor yeah um yeah i think it i'm not sure does it go to a temp fs not by default i'm asking jeff <laughs> so uh, just a couple of things in terms of write load it'll be about what <clears throat> excuse me uh, normal logging will be, and it will never grow beyond one gig. Once it hits one gig, it starts. Uh, yeah, that, it's a, that will still break SD. Yes. So in that case, the the package as it's deployed now, um, the config files read only. It's put in user share, um, yep. and but all the things are actually. I suppose the There's, the location the config file. Yeah, the sysconfig file is what is going to define the robust logging, and yep. that's and that's mm -hmm. fixed. But when you want to relocate uh, Varlib Velociraptor, that you'll need to probably mount somewhere else. And I think in that, I don't know if it's in the same directory is also where the key is. So that might be a little bit tricky. We can, we can sync up on that. So you mentioned that other EDR systems go to great lengths to prevent them from being tempered. With the Docile Raptor, it's not that way. Um, you also mentioned that events get cached if the system goes offline. Mm -hmm. Do you have any form of monitoring if data sources just vanishes? Because I, as an attacker, would remove that part <laughs> yeah, uh, and then do my thing. So um, mm -hmm. you probably need this, right? We, we can put like a in the uh, detection logic, like, hey, if this host is not reporting for, uh, I don't know, 24 hours, maybe we might want to do something about it. Currently, we don't have such rules. Most likely, we will put them in place later. Uh, like, really, the, the point isn't to, uh, you know, uh, 
hunt people down. If you're like, hey, your server is down, uh, we are going to spam you with uh, thousands of messages to put, bring it back up. No, no, that is not the purpose. But yeah, we, we do want to later once there will be, we get some stable numbers after the rollout, there will be some uptime monitoring. Uh, okay, thanks. Have we permanently forked Velociraptor, or are you contributing, or are you um, uh, pushing these changes back upstream? Um. If you want me to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a number of changes. We'd like to get everything upstream, is, is the short answer. Um, the log scale plugin is already upstream. Uh, the audit stuff uh, should be ready to go now, I think. Now, I, actually, no, there's still the buffering, uh, the buffer reuse that we need to fix that doesn't have any impact at runtime, but would flag it during testing. Um, the BPF stuff is solid, but before I wanna push it upstream, I think it really needs to be in shape so that we can actually load objects dynamically, um, rather than having all the objects built into the, the binary itself. Um, because I think that's realistically going to be the first bit of criti criticism that comes when we ask for it is, um, does every bit of functionality really need to be built into uh, Velociraptor itself, and so if we can make that dynamic, then I think that will be upstreamable. Um, but the short answer is yes. It's not. We have no intention of it being a permanent fork. Uh, one question: uh, Do you plan? Are there any plans to put this into SLE sixteen so that we or a customer can install this themselves? Oh, uh, currently the the plans are to have it only internally in SUSE. There were some plans to somehow like make product out of it or something that can be distributed further, but I don't think I, I don't know the current status on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so th there has been um, discussions about whether we want to turn this into a product, but mm -hmm. realistically it's not one of our core focuses. Mm -hmm. And especially as we'd like to push everything upstream, realistically I think if this is something that customers are interested in, and that may well be. I think this is an opportunity to partner with Rapid7 rather than doing it ourselves. I think that's everything. Thanks very much.